Hello everyone, this is Arya from EduReca. Today's video is all about interview questions that are asked for cybersecurity personals. So today's video will be actually divided into two parts. The first part will actually cover all the general questions that are asked for cybersecurity jobs. And the next part will cover the scenario-based questions that are asked in such interviews. Okay, so let's get started. So the first question is, what do you mean by cybersecurity? So as an interviewee, I'd expect that the candidate should first tell me the need for cybersecurity, his views on cybersecurity. So the candidate should be like this. Today's generation lives on the internet, and we general users are almost ignorant as to how those random bits of ones and zeros reach securely to our computer. For a hacker, it's a golden age. With so many access point, public IPs, and constant traffic, and tons of data to exploit, black hat hackers are having one hell of a time exploiting vulnerabilities and creating malicious software for the same. Above that, cyber attacks are evolving by the day. Hackers are becoming smarter and more creative with their malware and how they bypass virus scans and firewalls still baffle many people. Therefore, there has to be some sort of protocol that protects us against all these cyber attacks and make sure our data doesn't fall into the wrong hands. This is exactly why we need cybersecurity. Now for defining cybersecurity, here goes. Cybersecurity is a combination of processes, practices and technologies designed to protect networks, computers, programs, data, and information from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. Okay, so moving on to the next question is, what do you have on your home network? So a home network gives you a test environment for experimentation, Active Directory, Domain Controller, a dedicated firewall appliance, and a net attached toaster. As long as you are learning and fiddling with it, that's what matters. I've augmented the router my ISP provided, with an Apple Airport Extreme, which provides better wireless performance to some devices. From there, I've extended the wired part of the network into two parts of the house using five port ethernet switches, my office and living room, each with four devices. In the office, I have a network attached storage device, which provides shared data folders to every device. For movies and TV streaming, anywhere in the house, as well as backups. In the living room is a range of gaming consoles, a TiVo box and an Android media player, Despite owning a smart TV, it's not hooked into my network simply because the device we own do a far better job of anything the smart TV offers. Okay, now moving on to the next question is, what is encryption and why is it important? Well, a process of converting data into an unreadable form to prevent unauthorized access and thus ensuring data protection is called encryption. Encryption is important because it allows you to securely protect data that you don't want anyone else to have access to. Businesses use it to protect corporate secrets, governments use it to secure classified information, and many individuals use it to protect personal information to guard against things like identity theft. Okay, so that explains encryption and why it is important. Moving on, tell me the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Okay, so if we compare on the basis of keys, symmetric encryption has the same secret key for both encryption and decryption whereas asymmetric uses different keys for encryption and decryption purposes. Performance-wise, symmetric encryption is fast, but is more vulnerable, while asymmetric encryption is slightly slower due to high computation. Some examples of symmetric are DES and 3DES, while asymmetric, the most popular is RSA and Defi Hellman. Okay, so time for the next question. So what is the CIA triad? Now, in this question, the candidates should explain what is CIA triad and what it is used for. So here's the answer. The CIA triad for information security provides a baseline standard for evaluating and implementing information security, irrespective of the system and or organization in question, where confidentiality is all about making sure that data is accessible only to its intended individual. Measures undertaken to ensure confidentiality are designed to prevent sensitive information from reaching the wrong people while making sure that the right people can in fact get it. Integrity, on the other hand, is all about making sure that data is kept properly intact without it being meddled with an unauthorized way. Data must be changed in transit and steps must be taken to ensure that data can be altered by unauthorized people. These measures include file permission and user access controls. On the topic of availability, well, it is all about making sure that data and computers are available as needed by authorized parties. Moving on to the next question is, what do you understand by risk, vulnerability, and threat in a network. Well, threat refers to someone or something with the potential to do harm to a system or an organization. Moving on, vulnerability refers to a weakness of an asset that can be exploited by one or more attackers. In other words, it is an issue or bug that allows an attack to be successful. 
Last but not the least, risk refers to the potential for loss or damage when a threat exploits a vulnerability. Okay, the next question is, how do you report risk? Well, risk needs to be assessed first before it can be reported. There are two ways you can actually analyze risk. The first is, it can be either quantitative or qualitative. This approach is suitable for both technical and business guys. The business guys will see the probable loss in numbers while the technical guys will monitor and assess the impact and frequency. Now, depending on the audience, the risk can then be reported. Moving on, how do you differentiate between IPS and IDS systems? Well, first of all, IDS stands for Intrusion Detection System and IPS is Intrusion Prevention System. Now, IDS just detects the intrusion and leaves the rest to the administrator for assessment and evaluation or any further action. IPS, on the other hand, detects the intrusion and takes necessary actions to further prevent intrusion. Also, there is a difference in the positioning of devices in the network. Although they work on the same concept, the placement is very, very different. Moving on, what do you know about cybersecurity frameworks? Well, cybersecurity framework is a voluntary guidance based on existing guidelines and practices for organizations to better manage and reduce cybersecurity risks. Besides helping associations oversee and decrease probable risks, it was intended to cultivate risk and cybersecurity administration communications among both inner and outer authoritative partners. Most frequently adopted cybersecurity frameworks are PCI DDS, which stands for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, the ISO 2701 and 27002, which is the International Organization for Standardization, then CIS, which stands for Critical Security Control, and the most famous cybersecurity framework is NIST. Moving on to the next question, which is what is weak information security? Well, information security policy is considered to be weak if it does not meet the criteria of an effective one. The criteria include distribution, review, comprehension, compliance, and uniform. Information security is weak if the policy has not been made readily available for review by every employee within an organization, or the organization is unable to demonstrate that the employees understand the content of the policy document. This is when an information security is considered weak. Moving on to the next question is, what's the better approach of setting up a firewall? Okay, so following are the steps you should take to configure your firewall. The first is a username and password. Modify the default password for your firewall device. Next is the remote administration, which will disable the feature of remote administration from the outside network. Then comes port forwarding. For certain applications to work properly, such as a web server or FTP server, you need to configure appropriate port forwarding. Next comes the DHCP server which is installing a firewall on a network with an existing DHCP server will cause conflict unless the firewall's DHCP server is disabled. Then is logging. Now, in order to troubleshoot firewall issues or potential attacks, you want to make sure to enable logging and understand how to view the logs. Last but not least, we need to actually go through the policies. Now, if you want to have solid security policies in place, make sure that your firewall is configured to enforce those policies. Moving on to the next question is, can you explain SSL encryption? Now, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, and it is a protocol which enables safe conversation between two or more parties. It is designed to identify and verify that the person you are talking to on the other end is exactly who they pretend to be. We also have HTTPS, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, which is actually HTTP combined with SSL, which provides you with a safer browsing experience with encryption. So this is a very tricky question, but SSL wins in terms of security. Moving on, which one is more secure, SSL or TLS? Well, SSL is meant to verify the sender's identity, but it doesn't search for any more hazards than that. SSL can help you track the person you are talking to, but that can also be tricked at times. TLS is another identification tool just like SSL, but it offers better security features. It provides additional protection to the data and hence SSL and TLS are often used together for better protection. Moving on, what are salted hashes? Well, salt is actually random data. When a properly protected password system receives a new password, it creates a hash value of that password and adds a random salt value. Then the combined value is stored in its database. This helps defend against dictionary attacks and known hash attacks. Example, if someone uses the same password on two different systems and they are being used using the same hashing algorithm, the hash value would be same. However, if someone of the system uses salt with the hashes, the value will be different. Moving on to the next question, which is how can identity theft be prevented? Okay, so the following steps can be ensured 
to actually prevent identity theft. First of all, ensure a strong and unique password. Secondly, avoid sharing confidential information online, especially on social media. Third, shop from known and trusted websites only. Fourth, use the latest version of the browsers. Fifth, install advanced malware, spywares, and tools. Next, use specialized security solutions against financial data and always update your system and software. And last but not least, always protect your social security number. Now, moving on to the next question is, how can you prevent a man-in-the-middle attack? Okay, so an MITM attack happens when communication between two parties, that is systems, is intruded or intercepted by an outside entity. This can happen in any form of online communication, such as email, social media, web surfing, etc. Not only they are trying to eavesdrop on your private conversation, they can also target all the information inside your devices, and the outcome could be pretty catastrophic. So the first method to prevent this attack would be to have encryption, preferably public key encryption between both the parties. This way, they both will have an idea with whom they are talking with because of the digital verification. Secondly, to prevent this, it is best to avoid open Wi-Fi networks, and if it is necessary, then use plugins like HTTPS, force TLS, etc. Moving on to the next question, which is state the differences between encoding, hashing, and encryption. Okay, so the purpose of encoding is to transform data so that it can be properly and safely consumed by a different type of system. That is example of binary data being sent over email or viewing special characters on a web page. The goal is not to keep information secret, but rather to ensure it's able to be properly consumed. Examples include ASCII, Unicode, URL encoding, and Base64. Now, the purpose of encryption is to transform data in order to keep it secret from others. Example, sending someone a secret letter that only they should be able to read, or securely sending a password over the internet. Rather than focusing on usability, the goal is to ensure that data cannot be consumed by anyone other than the intended recipients. Examples include AES, Blowfish, and RSA. Now, hashing serves the purpose of ensuring integrity. That is, it makes sure that if something has changed, you know that some change has taken place. Technically, hashing takes arbitrary inputs and produces a fixed length of string. Example are SHA-3, MD5, which is now obsolete, and SHA-256, etc. Now, moving on to the next question, which is, what steps will you take to secure a server? Now, secure server uses the secure socket layer protocol for data encryption and decryption to protect data from unauthorized interception. Here are four simple ways you can actually secure a server. So the first way is that you make sure that you have a secure password for your root and administrator user. The secondly, the next thing you need to do is to make new users on your system. These will be the users you'll use to manage the system. Step three is remove remote access from the default or root administrator accounts. And the last step is to configure your firewall rules for remote access. Okay, so the next question is, what is a DDoS attack and how is it mitigated? Okay, so DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service. When a network is flooded with large number of requests, which is not recognized to handle, making the server unavailable to the legitimate request senders. DDoS can be mitigated by analyzing and filtering the traffic in the scrubbing centers. And the scrubbing centers are centralized data cleaning stations where in the traffic to a website is analyzed and malicious traffic is removed. Okay, so the 20th question is, why do you need DNS monitoring? The domain name system allows your website under a certain domain that is easily recognizable also keeps the information about other domain names. It works like a directory for everything on the internet. Thus, DNS monitoring is very important since you can easily visit a website without actually having to memorize their IP addresses. DNS has an important role in how end users in your enterprise connect to the internet. Inspecting DNS traffic between clients' devices and your local recursive resolver could be revealing a wealth of information for forensic analysis. DNS queries can reveal both botnets and malwares connecting to the CNC server. So this is why DNS monitoring is very essential. Moving on, what is a three-way handshake? The TCP three-way handshake in transmission control protocol is the method used by a device on a network to set up a stable connection over an internet protocol-based network. TCP's three-way handshaking technique is often referred to as a SYN, SYNAC, or more accurately, SYN, SYNAC, and ACK because of there are three messages transmitted by the TCP to negotiate and start a TCP session between two computers. Moving on to the next question is, what are black hat hackers, white hat hackers, and gray hat hackers? So like all hackers, black hat hackers usually have extensive knowledge about breaking into computer networks and bypassing security protocols. They are responsible for writing malware which is a method used to gain access to these systems. 
Their primary motivation is usually for a personal or financial gain, but they can also be involved in cyber espionages, protests, or perhaps just addicted to the thrill of cybercrime. Now, white hat hackers choose to use their power for good rather than evil. Also known as ethical hackers, white hat hackers can sometimes be paid employees or contractors working for companies as security specialists that attempt to find security holes via hacking. They employ the same method of hacking as black hats with one exception, that is they do it with permission from the owners of the system first, which makes the process completely legal. Now there comes gray hat hackers. As in life, they are gray areas that neither black nor white. Gray hat hackers are a blend of both black hat and white hat hackers. Often gray hat hackers will look for vulnerabilities in the system without the owner's permission or knowledge. If issues are found, they will report them to the owner, sometimes requesting a small fee to fix the issue. Okay, now moving on. How often should you perform patch management? Well, patch manage should be done as soon as it is released. For Windows, once the patch is released, it should be applied to all machines not later than one month. Same goes for network devices. We should patch it as soon as it is released. And proper patch management process should be followed too. Question number 24. What do you know about application security? Application security is a practice of improving the security of applications using software, hardware, and other procedural methods. Countermeasures are taken to ensure application security, the most common being an application firewall that limits the execution of files or the handling of data by specific installed programs. Moving on to the next question, which is differentiate between penetration testing and software testing. Now, penetration testing helps identify and address the security vulnerabilities, whereas software testing focuses on functionality of the software and not the security aspect. A good penetration tester truly thinks differently than the other two. They don't care about the proper behaviors of the system or software, and they are crafty, looking for that one small chink of vulnerability that was not mitigated. And software security testers generally have a fair amount of crossover as they usually know the full details of the system or software, and they know how it's supposed to properly behave when properly used, and they can test for a lot of the common end user misbehaviors. Moving on, when to use tracer or trace route. So trace route is a command which can show you the path a packet of information takes from your computer to the one you specify. It will list all the routers it passes through until it reaches its destination or fails to and is discarded. In addition to this, it will tell you how long each hop from router to router takes. Now, when you connect to a website, say howtogeek.com, the traffic has to go through several intermediaries before reaching the website. The traffic goes through your local router, your internet service provider's router, onto larger networks, and so on. Okay, so moving on to question number 27, which is tell me something about the common cyber attacks that plague us today. I'm going to be discussing eight cyber threats. Firstly, it's malware. Now, malware is an all encompassing term for a variety of cyber threats, including Trojans, viruses, and worms. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on your computer. Next is phishing. Now, phishing often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party. Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years, making it really difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for information from a false one. Phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are more harmful than just a simple ad. Next is a password attack. And a password attack is exactly what it sounds like that is a third party trying to gain access to your system by cracking a user's password, usually using some algorithm like brute force, dictionary attacks, or a software which is a key logo. Next is a DDoS attack, and a DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service to a network. Attackers send high volumes of data or traffic through the network until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. Next is a man in the middle attack, and a man in the middle attack is an attack where somebody is impersonating the endpoints in an online information exchange. For example, if you're a banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. Next is drive by downloads. And this is a malware which is actually implanted into a legitimate website or a program is downloaded to the user's system just by visiting the site. It doesn't require any type of action by the user to actually start to trigger the download. Next is malvertising, and malvertising is actually malicious code which is hidden behind advertisements on websites, and it is also downloaded to your system without your knowledge. Last but not the least is rogue software, which is malware that masquerades as legitimate and necessary security software that will keep your system safe.
Okay, so moving on to the next question is what are different OSI layers and what is the job of the network layers? Okay, so OSI or open system interconnection is a reference model for how applications communicate over a network. A reference model is a conceptual framework for understanding relationships and the purpose of the OSI reference model is to guide vendors and developers so the digital communication product and software programs they create can interoperate and to facilitate a clear framework that describes the function of a network or telecommunication system. The seven OSI layers are application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer. Okay, so the network layer is actually used for controlling the operations of the subnet, and the main job of this layer is to deliver packets from a source to a destination across multiple links. Moving on to the next question, which is how would you reset a password protected BIOS configuration? Now, since BIOS is a pre-boot system, it has its own storage mechanism for its setting and preferences. In the classic scenario, simply popping out the CMOS battery will be enough to have the memory storing these settings lose its power supply, and as a result, it will lose all its setting. Other times, you'll need to use a jumper or a physical switch on the motherboard. Still other times, you'll need to actually remove the memory itself from the device and reprogram it in order to wipe it out. The simplest way by far, however, is if the BIOS has come from the factory with the default password enabled, try the whole word password. Now for question number 30, what is cross-site scripting or XSS? Now XSS refers to client-side code injection attacks wherein an attacker can execute malicious scripts, also commonly referred to as malicious payload, into a legitimate website or web application. XSS is amongst the most rampant of web application vulnerabilities and occurs when a web application makes use of unvalidated or unencoded user input within the output it generates. By leveraging XSS, an attacker would exploit a vulnerability within a website or web application that the victim would visit, essentially using the vulnerable website as a vehicle to deliver a malicious script to the victim's browser. Now, what is data protection in transit versus data protection at rest? So the answer to that is that Data in transit or data in motion is data actively moving from one location to another, such as across the internet or through a private network. Data protection in transit is the protection of this data while it's traveling from network to network or being transferred from a local storage device to a cloud storage device. Wherever data is moving, effectively data protection measures for in transit data are critical as data is often considered less secure while in motion. Now data at rest is data that is not actively moving from device to device on network to network, such as data stored on a hard drive, laptop, flash drive, or archives, slash stored in some other way. Data protection at rest aims to secure inactive data stored on any device or network. While data at rest is sometimes considered to be less vulnerable than data in transit, attackers often find data at rest a more valuable target than data in motion. The risk profile for data in transit or data at rest depends on the security measures that are in place to secure data in either state. Moving on to question number 32 is tell me the differences between cybersecurity and network security. Okay, so cybersecurity describes that the policies and procedures implemented by a network administrator to avoid and keep track of unauthorized access, exploitation, modification, or denial of the network and the network resources. Network security describes the process and practices designed to protect network, computers, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. In a computing context, security includes both cybersecurity and physical security. While cybersecurity is concerned with threats outside the castle, network security is worried about what is going on within the castle walls. The cybersecurity specialist is the crusading knight defending the kingdom, and network security focuses on the barbarians at the gate and how the castle connects to the world around it. Moving on to question number 33, which is how will you prevent data leakage? Data leakage is when data gets out of the organization in an unauthorized way. Data can get leaked through various ways, that is emails, prints, laptops getting lost, unauthorized upload of data to public portals, removable drives, photographs, etc. A few controls can be restricting uploads on internet websites, following an internal encryption solution, restricting the mails to internal networks, or restriction on printing confidential data, etc. Moving on to the next question, which is what is ARP and how does it work? Okay, so address resolution protocol or ARP is a protocol for mapping an internet protocol address to a physical machine address that is recognized on the local network. On the topic of how it works, when an incoming packet destined for a host machine on a particular local area network arrives at a gateway, the gateway asks the ARP program to find a physical host or MAC address that matches the IP address. 
Now the ARP program looks into the ARP cache and if it finds the address, it provides it so that the packet can be converted to the right packet length and format and send it to the machine. Now, if no entry is found for the IP address, ARP broadcasts a request packet in a special format to all machines on the LAN to see if one machine knows that it has the IP address associated with it. So for question number 35 is, what is 2FA and how can it be implemented for the public websites? So an extra layer of security that is known as multi-factor authentication requires not only a password and username, but also something that only and only that user has on them. That is a piece of information only they should know or have immediately to hand, such as a physical token. Authenticator apps replace the need to obtain verification code via text, voice call, or email. For example, to access a website or web-based service that supports Google Authenticator, the user types in their username and password. That is a knowledge factor. Okay, now time for question number 36, which is what techniques can we use to prevent brute force login attacks? So here the attacker tries to determine the password for a target through a permutation of fuzzing process. As it is a lengthy task, attackers usually employ software such as Fuzzer to automate the process of creating numerous passwords to be tested against target. To avoid such attacks, password best practices should be followed mainly on critical resources like servers, routers, exposed services, and so on. Okay, so now time for the next question, which is what is cognitive cybersecurity? Now the applications of artificial intelligence technologies pattern on human thought process to detect threats and protect its physical and digital system. Self-learning security systems use data mining, pattern recognition, and natural language processing to simulate the human brain, albeit in a high-powered computer model. This is exactly what cognitive cybersecurity is. So what is port blocking within LAN? Well, restricting the users from accessing a set of services within the local area network is called port blocking. Stopping the source to not to access the destination node via ports as applications work on the port, so ports are blocked to restrict the access filing up the security holes in the network infrastructure. Okay, so time for question number 39, which is what is the difference between VPN and VLAN? Okay, so VPN is related to remote access to the network of a company, while VLAN basically means to logically segregate networks without physically segregating them with various switches. Now, while VPN saves the data from prying eyes while in transit and no one on the net can capture the packets and read the data, VLAN does not involve any encryption technique, but it is only used to slice up your logical network into different sections for the purpose of management and security. Okay, so it's time for question number 40. So the question is, what protocols fall under the TCP IP internet layer? Okay, so I'll be going through the five layers that consist the TCP IP protocol, and I'll also be listing out the protocols that are inside every layer. So starting with the physical layer, the protocols that reside in the physical layer are the Ethernet IEEE 802.3 and the RS-232 from one of the many protocols. And moving on to the data link layer, we have the Triple P protocol, the IEEE 802.2 protocol. Then moving on to the network layer, it's governed by the IP protocol, the ARP protocol, which is basically the address resolution protocol and the ICMP protocol. Then moving on ahead is the transport layer. Now the transport layer has two main protocols, namely the TCP and the UDP protocols. And last but not least, we have the application layer, which is governed by a multiple of protocols, namely NFS, NIS+, DNS, Telnet, FTP, RIP, SNMP, and various other protocols as such. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the general interview questions that might be asked in any cybersecurity interview. So now moving on to the scenario-based questions. So first, I'll be reading out the scenario, and then I'll ask the questions regarding the scenario too. Okay, so for scenario number one, we have, you received the following email from help desk. So the email goes as follows. Dear UCSC email user, beginning next week, we will be deleting all inactive email accounts in order to create space for more users. You are required to send the following information to continue using your email account. If we do not receive this information from you by the end of the week, your email account will be closed. So then the email actually goes on to ask the various credentials like name, email login, password, DOB, and alternate email. And then it says, please contact the webmail team with any questions and thank you for your immediate attention. So in such a scenario, what do you do and justify your actions for doing so? Okay, so this email is a classic example of phishing trying to trick you into biting. The justification is the generalized way of addressing the receiver 
which is used in mass spam mails. Above that, a corporate company will never ask personal details on mail. They want your information, so don't respond to the mail, instant message, text, phone calls, etc., asking you for your password or other private information. You should never disclose your password to anyone, even if they say they work for the UCSC, ITS, or any other campus organization. Moving on to the next scenario, which is a friend sends an electronic Hallmark greeting card to your work email. You need to click on the attachment to see the card. What do you do and justify your actions? Well, this one has four big risks. Firstly, some attachments contain viruses or other malicious programs. So just in general, it's risky to open unknown or unsolicited attachments. Secondly, also in some cases, just clicking on a malicious link can infect a computer. So unless you are sure a link is safe, don't really click on it. Third, email addresses can be fake. So just because the email says it is from someone you know, you can't be certain of this without checking with the person. Fourth, finally, some websites and links look legitimate, but they're really hoaxes designed to steal your information. So what we have to do is actually not click on the email and actually ignore it completely. Moving on to the next scenario, which is, one of the staff members in ITS subscribes to a number of free IT magazines. Among the questions she was asked in order to activate her subscriptions, one magazine asked her for a month of birth, a second asked for a year of birth, and a third asked for a mother's maiden name. What do you infer is going on in the situation and justify? Well, all three newsletters probably have the same parent company or are distributed through the same service. The parent company or service can combine individual pieces of seemingly harmless information and use or sell it for identity theft. Then it is even possible that there is a fourth newsletter that asks for a day of birth as one of the activation questions. Often questions about personal information are optional. In addition to being suspicious about situations like the one described here, never provide personal information when it is not legitimately necessary or to people or companies you don't personally know. So now time for scenario number four. Well, in our computing labs and departments, Print billing is often tied to users login. People log in, they print, and then they get a bill. Sometimes people call to complain about bills for printing they never did, only to find out that the bills are indeed correct. So what do you infer is going on in the situation and justify your inference? Sometimes they realize they loaned their account to a friend who couldn't remember his or her password, and the friend did the printing and thus the charges. It's also possible that somebody came in from behind them and used their account. Now, this is an issue with shared or public computers in general. If you don't log out of the computer properly when you leave, someone else can come in from behind and retrieve what you were doing and use your accounts. Always log out of accounts, quit programs, and close browser windows before you walk away from a general public computer. Now, moving on to scenario number five, we have that we saw a case a while back where someone used their Yahoo accounts at a computer lab on a campus. She made sure her Yahoo account was no longer open in the browser window before leaving the lab. Now someone came in behind her and used the same browser to reaccess her accounts. They started sending emails from it and caused all sorts of mayhem. So what do you think might have gone wrong here? Well, the first person probably didn't log out of her account, so the new person could just go into the history and access it. Secondly, another possibility is that she did log out, but didn't clear her web cache. This is done through the browser menu to clear pages that the browser has saved for future use. Time for scenario number six now. Okay, so two different offices on campus are working to straighten out an error in an employee's bank account due to a direct deposit mistake. Office number one emails the correct account and deposit information to office number two, which promptly fixes the problem. The employee confirms with the bank that everything has indeed been straightened out. So what is exactly wrong here? Well, account and deposit information is sensitive data that could be used for identity theft. Sending this or any kind of sensitive information by email is very, very risky because email is typically not private or secure. Anyone who knows how can access it anywhere along its route. So as an alternative, the two offices could have called each other or worked with the ITS to send the information in a more secure fashion. Okay, moving on to the next scenario, which is the mouse on your computer screen starts to move around on its own and click on things on your desktop. What do you do in such a situation? A, call your coworker over so they can see. B, disconnect your computer from the network. C, unplug your mouse. D, tell your supervisor. E, turn the computer off. F, run an antivirus. Or G, all of the above. So we have to select all the options that apply in the situation. 
So the options that apply are B and D, which is basically disconnect your computer from the network and tell your supervisor. So this is definitely suspicious. Immediately report the problem to your supervisor and the ITS support center. Also, since it seems possible that someone is controlling the computer remotely, it is best if you can disconnect the computer from the network and turn off wireless if you have it until help arrives. If possible, don't turn off the computer. Okay, time for scenario number eight. So below are a list of passwords pulled out of a database. Now, which of the following passwords meet the UCSC's password requirement? Okay, so the third password, which is option number C, is the only one that meets all the following of the UCSC's requirement. It has at least eight characters in length. It contains at least three of the following four types of characters, which are lowercase characters, uppercase characters, numbers, and special characters. And not a word is preceded or followed by a digit. So it's the third option which is correct in this situation. Moving on to the second last scenario we have for today is you receive an email from your bank telling you there is a problem with your account. The email provides instructions and a link so you can log in to fix your account and fix the problem in doing so. So what should you do? Well, we have to delete the email and better yet, use the web client that is Gmail, Yahoo Mail, etc., and report it as spam or phishing and then delete it. Any unsolicited email or phone call asking you to enter your account information, disclose your password, financial account information, social security number, or any other private or personal information is suspicious, even if it appears to be from a company you are familiar with. Always contact the sender using a method you know is legitimate to verify that the message is indeed from them. Okay, so it's time for our last scenario of the day, which is a while back, the IT folks got a number of complaints that one of our campus computers was sending out Viagra spam. They checked it out and the reports were true. A hacker had installed a program on the computer that made it automatically send out tons of spam email without the computer's own knowledge. So how do you think the hacker got into the computer to set this up? Well, this was actually the result of a hacked password. Using passwords that can be easily guessed and protecting your password by not sharing them or writing them down can help to prevent this. Passwords should be at least eight characters in length and use a mixture of uppercase, lowercase letters and numbers and symbols. Even though in this case it was a hacked password, other things could possibly lead to this are that out of date patches and updates, the lack of an antivirus software or an out of date antivirus software, or clicking on an unknown link or attachment, or downloading unknown or unsolicited programs onto your computer. Okay, guys, so that was it for the session on cybersecurity interview questions. If you all have any questions regarding any of the questions that were discussed here, please put a comment down below. If you all also want the PowerPoint presentation that's shown out here, you all can also comment for that. And if you all want any other cybersecurity related specific interview questions, please do comment for that. I'll make a video on them soon. That's it from me. Goodbye.